Um, thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. Um, I would like to present some part of the, my PhD work I'm doing. And I want to present you um, something about the history and the mechanisms of the Fram slide, which is a submarine landslide in the Fram stride northwest of Svalbard. And why are we actually interested in studying submarine landslides? Um, the motivation for that is that these landslides can um, destroy offshore infrastructure that we use for um, exploration um, purposes. And it can destroy open slopes on continental margins or on volcanic margins. And um, it can generate tsunamis this has been shown very well on the Storica slide, uh, which causes um, uh, run-up heights onto 20 meters in some locations. So why should we focus on the Fram slide? Why is it um, an interesting um, area to study on? Well, it might um, potentially um, force us to, to reassess the hypothesis that is used to explain most of the large landslides on the glaciated European margin in the North Atlantic. And um, I call this hypothesis the glacial dip reflow hemipelagic interlaying hypothesis. And it's why, because um, the common understanding is that the glaciated European margin is closely related to the extent of ice sheets um, during the different um, ice ages. And you can see that in front of these um, ice um, extenses, we have a very special sedimentation type and sedimentation rate. We have hemi hemipelagic um, sedimentation uh, in between the ice ages. And after the ice ages, we have a very um, high sedimentation rate and fast sedimentation of glacial debris flows. And of course, because of this interlayering, um, we can get overpressure in the pores, and this can destabilize the, the margin. And you can see in the image that this fits, fits very well to most of the large landslides on the glaciated European margin. And it believed that earthquakes um, are very um, yeah, very likely to have been the final trigger for the landslides. So the Fram, Fram slide is located in this, er in this area, north northwest of Swarbord, and you can see that it doesn't match the scheme, this hypothesis, because it's located um, about 35 kilometers off the nearest um, Trothmouth fan, and so this might be a good opportunity to study which other uh, mechanisms might be important for the occurrence of landslides. So we, I study the history of this complex and try to find out which mechanisms and step processes destabilize the margin. So this is a bathymetry map of the area, um, north is in this direction, and you can see um, that it's an area that's about 81 kilometers um, by 25 kilometers in this direction. We have a water depth of one, one kilometer to uh, 2.5 kilometers in which we have these um, scarps and um, alignments in the bathymetry. So there's evidence that we have um, a lot of landslides, um, but of course, just from the bathymetry, you can't know if these are head walls, side walls, or just faults, because we're very close to the um, fracture zone, the Spitsbergen fracture zone, which is related to the slow spreading ridge in this area of the Northern Atlantic. So, um, by having a look from, from the top and at the slope of the, um, of, the, uh, of, of the slope angle, we identified a huge number of these features. 
And as I said, you can't be uh, sure what these features are, but from some gravity course that we took, we can see that we have um, really nice um, mass transport deposits, um, even in gravity cores in this, um, in this one in two and a half meters depth. So we have recent mass transports um, that's, that's going on in this area. But to get a better idea of the history and of the recurrence frequency and therefore by, for the processes that caused these landslides, um, I will show you some of um, some seismic data, and I will start in the in the northern part, and we'll go down to the southern part. Um, so, up here we can see a very prominent feature. It's um, it's about um, 500 meters from up here to down there, um, and by having a look at the seismic data we can see that um, it's kind of divided in two, in two parts. And I identified two head walls here that are um, correlated or that, that um, occurred or happened um, in, the, in the same time because you can um, very well um, correlate the sediments that has been deposited afterwards. So we have these high head walls of this is about 340 meters and this is 250 meters, um, assuming a veloci velocity in the sediments of 1,600 meters per second. So these are huge and afterwards, um, and this has to be a very old event because we have up to 250 meters of sediment deposited on top. Of course, this varies, um, especially in the area of the old head walls, but if I have a look further upslope where I assume that the sedimentation rate is um, what, what I can assume as normal, it's about 250 meters. Um, other features are younger head walls um, further upslope and, of, and on, the, on the old um, head walls they might be caused because of the old big dis displacement and the gradient. Another feature that you can see here is the BSR, the bottom re um, simulating reflector. Um, this is the lower boundary of the stability, stability zone of the gas hydrates, and it, sh it indicates that we have free gas underneath um, the, the gas hydrates. Um, I want to go further south. I want to show you some data that's of a seismic profile that's um, crossing this section. Um, it's again in the bathymetry, it's about 200 meters high, um, so very prominent. And if we have a look at the seismic data, it's even higher. This is the 200 meters. And you can see that you, you get um, um, a head wall even there. Um, so my interpretation of this profile is that we have a head wall here, a very high one, and up to 400 meters, and we have some younger um, head walls in this area. And again, the BSR crossing the stratigraphy of the sediments, um, showing that we have methane or gas hydrates and free gas underneath, which is an indicator that we might have fluid systems that enhance the, or increase the, the pore pressure and might destabilize um, the slope or the, the gas hydrates could even stabilize and, uh, the sediments. So there are two possibilities to interpret um, the gas hydrates and the free gas. So in this, to, to give a short summary, so we have in this area a very old feature and um, this is most likely the side wall and this the head wall that might go around here. Now I want to come to the more southern part because you can see already in the bathymetry that it looks quite different. There are, not, there are multiple features with um, not as big heights as in the northern part. And having a look at this part of the seismic data, um, we can see um, 
already without my interpretation, you can see that here's a younger head wall with just about eight meters of sediments on top, which um, continues here on a different um, shear surface. We have the nice BSR crossing here, the sediment, the, the layered sediments. And if you have a look at my interpretation, we have a huge number of head walls. We have really old events that in this case happened just on one shear, shear surface. And if you go upwards the slope, you see that it's really high. It seems to be not that high here, but if you go further upslope, you see that a lot of sediments has been de deposited afterwards. So um, we have really old events and really young events. And in this case, the younger events seems to be retrogressive or like at least has different shear, shear surfaces. So we have different types of, of mass wasting. Um, as I told you already, we, we're really close to the um, Spitsbergen transfer fold. Um, so there's a question, is if all these things are really, um, these features are caused by, by mass wasting or if we have faults as well. And if we have a look at this very close part to the, to the fracture zone, we see that we have some faults. We have great displacement. And um, so we have faults that go up to the seafloor. So they're pretty young. And this one has estimated displacement of 50 meters. Um, on the other hand, we have faults that are not going up to the sea surface, a seafloor surface. So they're older. Um, so there is a lot of um, tectonic activity in the, especially in the southern part, which we have to consider if we're thinking about processes that might have caused this end slide. So now I want to conclude and um, give you a sum up about my results. Um, first, this Fram slide, which you can see here again, is um, very um, important to study because it's about 60 kilometers off the shelf and at least 35 kilometers of the um, Super Bunken fan, which is um, related to glacier deeper flows. So we don't have a big impact of um, glacial deeper flows in this area. So there has to be um, another hypothesis um, that explains the submarine landslides, and we might ha we have to reassess the hypothesis that is used for a lot of other big landslides. Um, I've shown you that we have very prominent features. Um, in the northern part, we might have a big event of up to 600 cubic kilometers volume, and it's probably very old if um, I try to correlate it with the IOP borehole in close by. In the southern part, we have a huge number of smaller landslides of different age. So there is a long history of landslides and um, different recurrence frequency, different age, and different part of the, of the, of the complex. And so we might have to um, think about that there are even different mechanisms within the Fram slide complex. And, um, uh, Features for these processes uh, could be rela rela related to the BSR, which is very prominent. This could be um, destabilizing or even stabilizing with regards to the gas or the um, gas hydrates. We have contourites, which um, reveal to a different sedimentation rate in different parts. And we have the faults in about three kilometers depth. So, we have to um, consider um, contrary currents, tectonic movement, and fluid migration for the southern part. For the northern part, I think that the tectonic um, uh, movement is not that uh, prominent, and we don't have to think about it that much. So thank you very much.